What does TDR stand for? If you're around people who do cable testing or you use cables, very often people just say, hey, are we going to do a TDR? Or yeah, the TDR and, and things like that. So people use TDR, the abbreviation TDR, in different respects. And sometimes they mean different, similar things, but not the same. Nevertheless, TDR stands for Time Domain Reflectometry. So what does it mean? Well, we are doing some kind of a reflectometry, very easy, and it's going to do in time domain. So let's make it very easy and take a real life example. Imagine the following thing. I'm standing at a tunnel, like in front of a tunnel, but the other end of the tunnel is closed. And I would like to know how long is the tunnel. So what do I do? I clap in my hands. The, uh, the, the sound travels inside the tunnel. At the end of the tunnel, it will be reflected and it comes back. And if I'm able to hear the echo of my clapping, then I can stop the time. And based on the time, I can figure out how long the tunnel is. Why? Well, if I know the speed of sound inside my tunnel, which could be roughly around 330 meters per second, something like that, I have, an, have a possibility to figure out um, how long the tunnel is. And we're going to do the same thing with cables. The main reason we're doing this with cables is very often, even the owner doesn't really know how long the cable is. They have their project plan and they say, okay, so we got a cable from this point to this point. And according to my plan, it is exactly 470 meters feet long. Doesn't really matter, just an arbitrary number. However, the people who, and, and the people who installed the cable, they were paid for 470 meters, right? However, very often they can't go in a straight line, they find a rock or something like that, they have to swivel around, they have to take another turn, uh, the turn has a bigger radius or whatever. Sometimes people put uh, excessive wire very close to the end of the cable. So for example, if you have, there are substations in the world that are in, in housings, for example, in, uh, in skyscrapers or in substations and things like that, where the, where the, uh, where the cable comes um, uh, from the ground and goes through the concrete, to, through the foundation. And very often people have the tendency to put like one extra round there. So in case something happens with your end termination, you can just literally pull a little bit more cable, redo the cutback, redo the end termination. So very often the cable has a different length than what the people think, what is written in their plan. And that's important for us when we're testing partial discharges on cables, because if we find something, we need to figure out where it is. Furthermore, TDR can help us to find impedance changes in the cable. And for example, a joint, in the US they call it the splice, is an impedance change. And if the joint or the splice is done on site, very often we can find it because the impedance change is big enough. If it is something which is called a factory joint or a baked joint, uh, then it's kind of hard, but often the ones done on site we can find. So now let's talk about time domain reflectometry and what time domain means. Time domain is really cool. We're having a diagram here and our domain is time. Ta-da! We already explained two words because we are working in time domain. And reflectometry means, well, we're going to reflect something. So let's start uh, with blue. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to connect my measurement equipment here, right? And I'm having my measurement instrument here and I'm connecting it by some means to a cable. We learned that actually it needs to be a coupling capacitor and a low voltage capacitance, sometimes called quadrupole, right? The funny thing is at this very moment, I probably don't even need that because I'm doing a low voltage measurement and very often I don't need my high voltage divider yet. This being said, if I'm going to do a partial discharge measurement anyway, I probably would just set everything up and to make sure, okay, everything is set up in place, then I'm doing my TDR and uh, so I'm going to measure through that. So, as you like. So now I need a... Um, um, a calibrator. I'm taking the calibrator and I'm connecting the calibrator between ground and my conductor inside my cable. That's important. And now I'm going to inject a signal. It is a low voltage signal, depends on the manufacturer. It could be a couple of volts, it could be a couple of hundred volts. Then you have to figure out if you, do, if you do need a coupling capacitor. And um, it's a little bit like a calibration signal. The idea is calibration signal is supposed to be rather short and rather high, right? So I'm going to inject that. And um, so the, the, the pulse looks a little bit like this, example given, and will travel 
through the cable and then it will bounce back. So at a certain point in time, I do not know where zero here is, I, I'm not going to define it, I'm just going to measure this one. Congratulations, this is obviously my calibration signal, the one I just injected. And now I'm going to wait. And how long I'm going to wait? Well, that depends on the length of the cable. So let's say the cable it travels here, it bounces back. Why does it bounce back? Well, it's not connected to anything. So this is an open end, so therefore the resistance is more or less infinitively high, therefore this uh, signal will bounce back. So the signal bounces back, comes back, and I'm going to measure it here. Ah, maybe, maybe I should have drawn this a little bit different. Maybe it is a little bit higher and a little bit... So let's say it is like... like this. Funny thing, it is a little bit smaller, it is a little bit wider, but if everything is cool, then the area in here and the area in here is almost the same. Maybe I'm not really good in drawing, but that's what it is. But the most important thing is, what I want to figure out is, what is the time in between here? And let's say this is two microseconds. Ta-da! Now I know that my cable is one microsecond long, because it takes one microsecond to go here. I won't be able to measure anything here. If it comes back, um, then I have waited two microseconds. Awesome! So, the cable is two microseconds long, and now, depending on the cable, depending on where you are in the world, that's a different length. Um, high voltage cables have the tendency to have a little bit of a faster propagation speed, medium voltage cables are lower, and then it depends on the insulation. So, you know what? Let's, let's say, Let's say that the propagation speed is around, let's say, 150 meters per microsecond, which is very roughly 500 feet per microsecond. So, let's say this is more or less. But the interesting thing is, I don't really worry about this so much, because actually I'm only talking about, uh, talking about the time distance, uh, time, uh, the, the, the time difference I had. So, um, that's pretty much it. You just understood TDR, at least the basics of it. Interestingly enough, very often I'm going, so if this is, this is two microseconds, I'm going, probably going to have another pulse here and probably going to have another pulse here. Why? Because the signal will bounce back, back and forth and forth. So um, if this would be an ideal cable, I said if everything would be cool, the error below the curve here and here would be the same, and here and here, it is not. Obviously, I have certain, some, I have certain resistance in the cable, I'm always losing a little bit of charge, losing some of the current, so therefore this will get smaller and smaller. So now the only question is, how many bounce backs do I see? It could be indefinitely, however, there's always a certain kind of noise, right? So there will always be some kind of a noise floor. So, if I do this, okay, so maybe, maybe I can't see the last bounce, or the, that's the first bounce back, the second and the third, so maybe I can't see the third bounce back, because I have this, I have this noise floor here. Uh, by the way, how do we measure it? Since we are not really talking about partial discharge testing yet, very often we do not do the integration of these pulses, so very often we're working actually in millivolt. So this would be volt, and most likely in millivolt. And um, it doesn't really matter so much how big my millivolt is, so most likely this millivolt is very similar to what I injected, because probably I'm going to measure most of it, right? And then this one would be smaller, smaller and smaller. So, now I can tell the client, according to my measurement, your cable is two micrometers long, and so if I take this as a propagation speed, it is uh, 150 meters long. The interesting thing is, what happens if there's actually a joint inside, a change of impedance, and this is something I would like to know about. So, let's say I'm going to put, um, going to put a joint here. Um, let's not put it exactly in the middle. Let's put it here. Um, I think it just made things more difficult for me, but that's what it is. So, this is about, this is about 0 0.5 microseconds. So, let's say this is about 0 0.7 for me to make it easier. Uh, it's not even easy. Okay. So, I'm injecting my pulse. Now it's green, right? Now I have a, have a green calibrator. And now I'm still expecting something after two microseconds. But 
since this pulse is traveling here, a part of the pulse, let's say, I don't know, let's pretend 80% of the pulse that is coming from here, you know, this is my pulse, are allowed to travel over here, and let's say 20% make a return. So now let's imagine there's not so much damping on, and we just pretend, we just make something, for, uh, we, we just say this was 100 millivolts. We just pretend this was 100 millivolts. So, and there is almost no attenuation. Then, my pulse travels here, 0 0.7 microseconds, now it comes back. So after about 1.4 microseconds, that's exactly here and here, after 1.4 microseconds, I'm expecting a pulse that is 20 millivolts high. So this pulse goes here and then it comes back. And let's imagine now everything, now 100% are allowed to pass through. Won't happen, but let's imagine 100% pass through. Then this one obviously is smaller now because we lost something. So this is more or less time domain reflectometry. It becomes really interesting if you have multiple cables and if you actually say, okay, this pass-through isn't really happening, it's not 100% that pass-through because only 80% are allowed to travel through and then this bounces back and so on and so on. So now let's imagine we're having, um, we're having another joint here or another splice and let's say that is, uh, that is, a, that is a 0 0.2 0 .2 microseconds, then I need to redraw that, so just give me a second. So now we are back and I made this axis a little bit longer and obviously this is different time scales now. So now let's do this again and let's say my first pulse, the one I'm injecting, is here. So let's say that's 100 millivolts. I could pick any other number if I want to. It could be 200, it could be 5 volts, it could be 10 volts. I just choose one number. I don't even know if this is vaguely close to what uh, time domain reflectometry calibrators or injectors actually create. The longer the cable, the more likely it is that you are amplifying the signal and you're putting a much higher one in. I've heard of cases where uh, for very, very long cables it was up to 100 volts, but we we're talking about like kilometers and kilometers of cable where somebody would actually wanted to know are we actually able to reach the end. Okay, so I got that. And now let's imagine I have, a, I have a one joint here. So this is 0 0.2 microseconds from here, right? Then this is 0 0.7 microseconds from the beginning and the whole cable is one microsecond long. You know, we said two microseconds because this is how long it takes to go from one end and come back. So, um, what do I get? Well, probably I will get a signal which is about, which is rather small. So maybe there's a 20% of my original cable and now the time difference. Now I have to figure out where do I, how do I measure like when it starts rising, but very often um, the software or the hardware will have a peak detection, where is the peak, so therefore this would be my peak, this would be my peak, and this would be 0 0.4, 0 0.4, don't have to put microseconds there because it's already there, so I'm getting this. So the next one I will get after 1.4 microseconds, so if this is 0 0.48, I think I messed up my whiteboard, so let's pretend I'm getting another signal and let's pretend up to he from here to here this is 1.4 microsecond, right? And then I would still get one after, if this is 1.4 I have a problem, but now I will get a bigger one and this would be my 2 microseconds. So very often I will not only do one shot, very often I do multiple shots. Why? Well, at the same time this is one of the problems, right? At the same time, I'm having noise out here. We talked about this uh, in two videos, you can find them here. And noise will couple in as well. So if I have a noise pulse coupled in here and it will travel in different directions, the, the, the noise will actually bother me as well, especially if I have a repetitive noise. So I can easily say that there's probably a certain noise floor here. And um, now I have to figure out, I have to correlate all of these 
signals with each other and uh, the most manufacturers actually offer a software that makes something like a statistical answer like a histogram where they put all of the signals there and uh, you will always get a signal here you will always get a signal here and they will always get a signal here so the more signals you have at this point and more the more likely it is that you can say oh, okay the rest is probably noise but i can really clearly see there is a, a repetitive event at this time difference um, of course obviously my whiteboard isn't long enough but of course you would get everything again over there and over there because these signals travel for a long time by the way there is one thing that uh, could bother us because obviously we have just example given we have a signal that you know it's repelled over here so it happens after zero po uh, oh. now i'm not clever enough we have 0 0.3 microseconds distance here so obviously we have a signal that bounces back and forth right because not if, if, if only 80 percent are allowed to pass and 20 percent will stay here and uh, pretending there would be no attenuation then we actually have we are going to get something which is 0.6 microseconds difference because this is the difference between these two signals and now depending on where we kind of trigger we're getting get something here and we also probably going to get some we're going to get two signals where one signal is this one is here this one is here so 0 0.5 microseconds we're going to get something as well because there will always be a signal that travels back and this one travel back as well so i want to give you an example it's not five, uh, 0 0.5 microseconds is one microsecond so let me just draw this once and I hope I don't make a total fool out of myself so these two signals travel together right this one takes two point, uh, 0 0.2 microseconds to come back and now this is a new signal for me I can trigger on that so this would be suddenly this signal this one is already here, it travels here, it comes back and the difference between these two things is 0 0.5 microseconds, 0 0.5 microseconds, then it travels here. So um, I'm going to get something after one microsecond as well. And this is what I have to deal with. Um, I don't want to get too much in the nitty and gritty, otherwise, otherwise I make a fool out of myself. Uh, if you've got any specific questions you want to understand about time domain reflectometry, just uh, send me a, a, a comment, uh, just send me an email or put a comment in the, in the video and then we could go into that a little bit deeper. Thank you very much for watching and see you soon.